Amen. Many thanks to our Jubilation Ringers uh, for providing music for us this morning. We'll hear from them a little bit later in our worship. Good morning. And welcome to all of those who are here on a blustery and somewhat cooler than yesterday morning. Also to those who are joining us online. It was... It is a change from yesterday indeed, uh, and uh, we certainly had some things blow in. We are mindful this morning of the destruction that came with that storm yesterday, and uh, unfortunately the loss of life. There are seven so far that I know of uh, who were killed by the storm, so we keep them and their families and those communities directly affected by that uh, in our prayers today as well as for the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. It is the first Sunday in Lent. And Lent is this season of renewal as we follow Jesus on his journey to Jerusalem and the cross, and as we renew and revive our own faith journey. And our focus today, along with Jesus, is on temptation. What is that? How do we deal with it? But as blustery and cool and somewhat somber a morning it is, it is good that we are gathered together. I invite you to stand for the confession and forgiveness. We begin... In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy. And we long to be free, rebuild what we have ruined, and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood, make us alive in spirit to follow in the way of Jesus, as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace by the saving love of Jesus Christ. The wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. And we sing.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide us now so that following your Son, we may walk safely through the wilderness of this world towards the life you alone can give through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. We'll continue with the readings. The first reading comes from Deuteronomy, the 26th chapter, verses 1 through 11. The annual harvest festival, called the Festive of Weeks, provides the setting for this reading. This festival celebrates the first fruits of the produce of the land offered back to God in thanks. In this text, worshipers announce God's gracious acts on behalf of Israel. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Armin was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien. Few in number, and there he became a great nation mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. Word of God, word of life. The psalm is Psalm 91, and we'll read responsively by whole verse. You who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, you will say to the Lord, my refuge and my stronghold, my God and my God, my God. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your habitation. No evil. For God will give the angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. You will tread upon the lion cub and viper. You will trample down the lion and the serpent. They will call me and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. The second reading comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 8b through 13. Paul reminds the Christians at Rome of the foundation of their creed, the confession of faith in the risen Christ as Lord. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. This is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips 
that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite us to stand as we sing our greeting to the gospel. <coughs> Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during these days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Temptation is the word of the day. Jesus is in the wilderness, a place in the Jewish imagination that is filled with trials from God, testing. Like their 40 years in the wilderness before being led into the promised land. And the question is, when times are difficult and it is not easy to be faithful, are you? Now, when you think of being tempted, what immediately comes to mind? What are the things that you are tempted by? Now, first in my mind, I am tempted by that really good-looking piece of pie or that decidedly unhealthy breakfast biscuit sandwich by that new book. By the Rikon 10, 326, 14-inch bandsaw, or maybe the Laguna 1412, I, I can't make up my mind. I'm tempted by the next YouTube video. Can you relate to any of that? Now, while these are the first things to come to my mind, they are not the things Jesus is tempted by. The devil who's only mentioned once more in the Gospel of Luke after this passage, is tempting Jesus around his identity. While our text reads that the devil says, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread, 
several translators agree that it would be better read since you are the Son of God. The point being that even the devil concedes that Jesus is the Son of God. And so the temptations for Jesus lie around how the Son of God should act. As commentator Joel Green frames it, the devil tries to get Jesus to see the title Son of God as a power to be exercised, not as an office to be held an office that serves as an agent of God and is faithful to God and God's desires. Jesus has been in the wilderness a long time without food. He's hungry. And the temptation is to use that power as son of God to turn these abundant stones around him into some nice baguettes. Or maybe an Asiago focaccia, hmm? Right? It has some really good bread. Jesus responds, humans shall not live by bread alone. This echoes Deuteronomy 8.3, which reads, God humbled you by letting you hunger, then feeding you with manna, with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus rejects using his power for his own benefit. You can do it, the devil seems to say, so why not end your hunger? Rather, Jesus sees his relationship with God as an office and suggests that even though he is hungry, Jesus trusts that God will provide food for him in God's own time. Next is the offer to rule the world. If only Jesus would do obeisance to the devil. I'm going to show my age here a bit, but the image that comes to my mind at this passage is always of the old Christopher Reeve Superman II movie, Kneel Before Zod. Go check it out on YouTube if you need a reminder. The implication in the offer is that all those who rule earthly kingdoms, which in that day and age certainly meant the Roman Empire, do so only through a deal with the devil. Now there's a warning to think about. What the devil offers is a change of identity to no longer be the Son of God, who is promised a kingdom, but not of this world, but to be son of the devil and rule the world now. Once again, Jesus rejects this use of power by his own authority and action and responds by affirming his fidelity as the Son of God, God's agent. And finally, the devil takes Jesus to Jerusalem, the very place that we know Jesus is heading on this Lenten journey. Since you're the son of God, the devil says, test out those powers and do a base jump from the temple here without a parachute. After all, Scripture says, God will not let you be harmed. Now, there's another cautionary note. Even the devil knows Scripture and can make a good argument based on it. Now, we know Jesus is a risk taker, but like the first temptation, Jesus trusts God, basically saying in response, I don't ram my truck into a tree just to believe the airbag will deploy if I need it. So unlike where our minds maybe first go when we hear the word, temptation, what Jesus faces is a trial about his identity, his relationship with God. And the devil's very clever about the way in which he does it. Commentator Fred Craddock notes that true temptation is not about doing what we can't do, but about doing what is within our power. 
we are tempted by the very things that we can do. And so the greater power we have, the greater the temptation. A real temptation, he argues, is not an offer to fall, but an offer to rise, or at least one that seems so. For Jesus, the temptation to make bread from stones can be seen not only as about his own hunger, but about his ability to feed the hungry of the world. It's got to at least cross his mind that he could do good in feeding them. If he does this very thing for himself, could he not also then in his travels provide the people of Galilee and beyond with unlimited bread and offer not to fall, but to rise? What kind of good could Jesus do by taking over the earthly kingdoms? What justice could he bring in the face of Roman occupation? What bloodshed could he end? He's different than they are, isn't he? Why not establish his kingdom on earth now? An offer not to fall, but to rise. These temptations are so because Jesus could do these things, because he and we could make an argument that they are good things, right? True temptation, Craddock argues, beckons us to th that about which much good could be said. To strike before the innocent are harmed to take the levers of power because we, because I, will exercise them in a more just and corrupted way than those other people. We are good and sometimes even right in our rationalizations that can lead us to follow the temptation before us. Things that are within our power to do, but which ultimately move us away from our identity as beloved children of God, claimed in the waters of baptism, things that lead us to trust ourselves and our judgments more than following Jesus. But along with this identity and faith, Jesus had something else working for him. Look at that text again. Jesus was being led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. The language used implies that the Holy Spirit is with Jesus throughout his time in the wilderness rather than just leading him to the edge of it and kind of letting him go on his way. That the Holy Spirit is leading Jesus even in each of these temptations by the devil. If nothing else from this story, than others because we want to do good for others, don't we? Because we want to lessen suffering. We want to speak for equity for all people regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, of where they live or how they earn a living. And in our desire to do these things, we are often tempted to follow our own judgment and not God's guidance. But what we're promised through this story and through our baptism is that as people of faith, we do not face these temptations alone. That we go armed with our identity as beloved child of God, claimed by God in the waters of baptism, and that we too are led by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us in baptism. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. That we follow after Jesus in this life. The one who knows what it is to be tempted and to ignore that temptation. Now all this may not help me much in my decision between the Rikon and the Laguna. <laughs> 
or whether or not to eat that wonderful looking piece of pie. But it will surely help me to stop and think long and hard as I am tempted about what to do that is within my power. To think long and hard. Is this what I want or what God wants? Is the vision of justice and peace that I bring the same as what God brings? How often have we convinced ourselves that we will bring peace through war? Hmm? That idea reminds me of an episode of the West Wing where President Bartlett is angry at the options of a proportional response that he has been offered after Syria downs a U.S. military plane on a medical mission. He longs to institute Pax Romanus, the knowledge that a citizen of Rome could walk throughout the empire and be unassailed because if they were harmed in some way, those who did so knew that the might of the Roman Empire would come down on them like a ton of bricks. His chief of staff, Leo, says, yeah, you could do that. That's within your power. But then he talks about why he, Leo, would rise up against him because it would place the president in opposition to everything that a democracy stands for. What it comes down to is for ourselves and for the companies that we work for and for our church and our town and our nation is that just because we can, and remember, temptation lies in doing things that are within our power. Just because we can doesn't mean we ought. And what decides that? Not us, but our identity as child of God, gifted with the same Holy Spirit that is leading Jesus, walking behind Jesus, listening to what he says, doing what he does. And how do we listen? How do we attend to the Spirit's leading of us? Well, through prayer is a good one. Conversation with God, which is both speaking and listening, discerning, pondering, sitting with. Through our time in community with other believers who will help keep us on the path behind Jesus, who will warn us when we're going astray, kind of like Leah warned the president. And so as we go forth this week into a world that is full of temptations, may we trust in our own identity and call as Jesus did. May we go comforted by the knowledge that the Holy Spirit leads us to. And may we, when we are tempted, pray this little part of the Lord's Prayer to remember. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thanks be to God. I invite us to stand as we sing our hymn of the day.
us confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church, deepen our knowledge and understanding of Scripture so that your people learn to reject voices of deception and distraction. Strengthen and correct all who are tempted to believe lies about themselves or others. Merciful God, we pray for the earth and all its creatures. Sustain farmers and all laborers who work the land and harvest the fruits of its abundance so that all might have enough. Merciful God, we pray for the nations of the world, especially for Russia and Ukraine, that the war might cease, for wisdom and strength for leaders in standing up for what is right, and that you would thwart the plans of the wicked and give success to those who strive for peace and justice. Merciful God, we pray for those in need. Rescue those experiencing mental illness or contending with addiction. Ease the anxiety of those who live with dementia. Command your angels concerning all who are sick. Especially we pray for Brenna, Rick, Amy, April, David, Del, Sally, John, Anne, Jane, Abby, Deb, Cheryl, Shayla, Cooper, Stephanie, Lee, Mark, Marius, Pearl, Dan, Hunter, Tammy, Catherine, Kenny, Diane, Donna, Rachel, Morris, Marv, Lenora, Lillian, Judd, and all those whom we name now aloud in the silence of our hearts. Sasha, Lauren. Merciful God. We pray for this assembly during these 40 days of Lent, especially as we practice our prayer life. Open our ears to hear your voice. Guide us as we ponder our mission. Expand our imagination for ministry. Merciful God. Accept the prayers we bring, O oh God, on behalf of a world in need for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share that peace with one another as we are comfortable. Peace always works. And then I will invite you to be seated. And then I'll invite you to be seated. Many thanks this day to all of those who have made offerings of themselves to our jubilation ringers this morning, Terry on the AV. Uh, the Noskas uh, for hosting this morning, uh, for Marlene for reading. Uh, we also are thankful uh, for Butch and Annette who are providing some fellowship opportunity for us between services. An opportunity for all of us to offer of ourselves is our prayer wall, which I think is both especially important and good to be reminded of this Lenten season as we journey to grow our prayer life. It's located just outside the side door behind, by uh, the bathrooms. I would invite you to, throughout this season, put your own prayer requests out there. It can be a word. It can be a phrase. Uh, remember, it is public. Uh, all you need to do is put it on there, and it will be held in prayer throughout this season. And finally, thanks to all of you for the offerings of your own resources given to the mission and ministry 
of this place. If you wish to do that this morning, you can leave an offering in the plate that is on the table through the center doors uh, out in the gathering area, or you can always give online through our website, stjohnely.org. And now, as we prepare to receive this offering of Christ's own body and blood given to us, I invite us to receive this gift offering of music. Let us pray. Extravagant God, you have blessed us with the fullness of creation. Now we gather at your feast, where you offer us the food that satisfies. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, With the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God, our living water and our merciful guide, together with rivers and seas, wells and springs, we bless and magnify you. You led your people Israel through the desert and provided them water from the rock. 
We praise you for Christ, our rock and our water, who joined us in our desert, pouring out his life for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, we await your salvation for all this thirsty world. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this food and on all the baptized gathered for this feast. Wash away our sin that we may be revived for our journey by the love of Christ. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Here is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Come to the table of mercy and joy. Here's what I think we're going to try and do based on our size crew. This will help our ushers out, actually. I'm going to invite us to come as one table. So I'm going to invite you to come to the foot of the steps. So if you're standing over here, or sitting over here, I invite you to kind of start standing here, and we'll just kind of go this way. I think we can get everybody in. I'll come down the line, body of Christ given for you, and then I'll come down the line with the wine. That way, all shall be fed. So I invite you to come forward.
Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May we be, may our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace in our prayer, the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A couple of announcements of things that are going on. I forgot to do this early on, but just so you know, the little half sheet that we have available uh, out on the uh, table uh, as you come in uh, does have uh, our schedule for the week, but also on the back are some of the kind of key announcements that are in our e-news. So if there's ever a time where either you don't get it or you kind of, oh, shoot, what's going on? That's always a good helpful reminder. Feel free to take one home. Now, the verbal reminder of those things, um, reminder, our Lent study uh, on prayer. Today is a break day because, remember, Sundays aren't counted uh, in Lent. So day five, chapter five, will begin tomorrow. You can still join us in that reading if you wish. I hope for those of you who are participating, it is going well. Um, and uh, there will be an opportunity for those who are present on Wednesday at our seven o'clock midweek Lenten service. Uh, to meet and talk uh, together. Uh, we have our Stephen ministers who are willing to serve as facilitators, so some conversation around how this first week has gone. Rem reminder of our midweek Lenten services, but before that, 6 o'clock p.m., uh, soup supper. We're mostly full, but I think there's still a few things, sandwiches, and yes, hot dogs are sandwiches according to our uh, counting, uh, and maybe one more soup. Uh, if you would be uh, willing and available to do that, we'd love to have you come join us to eat uh, and to worship as well. Finally, a reminder that next Sunday, uh, the Bishop of the Southeastern Iowa Synod of the ELCA, Amy Current, will be with us. Uh, she will be preaching and uh, presiding with us at both services. Also, she will be meeting with us between services, uh, an opportunity I have uh, told her to prep for questions that you may have, and for her to be able to share with us a little bit about uh, her understanding of the state of the church, both in southeastern Iowa, the ELCA, but maybe perhaps in a larger context. So we invite you to join with us for that. And unless there are other things that need to be announced at this moment, I invite you to receive this blessing. Your children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you this day and always. Amen. And we sing. <laughs>
marked with the cross of Christ, go forth to love and serve the Lord. Amen. There you go, I heard that. Thank you.